Hello, everyone. I'm Ivo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. A lot of news to cover. We'll talk about Finland and uh, Sweden joining NATO and the latest in Ukraine. Then we'll look at Biden's first trip to Asia, and we'll end up with the summit of the Americas and wonder whether if we throw a party, anybody will show up. Here to talk about all of this is Gideon Rothman from London. Gideon is the foreign affairs commentator at the Financial Times. Gideon, great to have you back. Nice to be back, Eva. And from Washington, D.C., Nahal Tusi, senior foreign affairs correspondent for Politico. Nahal, great to have you back. Thanks for having me. And Karen DeYoung, also from Washington, associate editor and national security uh, correspondent for the Washington Post. Karen, great to have you. Thank uh, you. Karen, let's, let's, uh, let, let's start off with you. Yesterday, the pr prime minister of Sweden and the president of <coughs> Finland uh, came to Washington to try to convince the Biden administration and importantly, the, the, the Senate uh, to agree to let both countries enter NATO. Uh, no one. And I, I, I really mean this. No one saw this coming uh, before the 24th of February. Uh, there were people who wanted this to happen, uh, many in Sweden and in Finland, but they were a, major, a, a minority and had been for a very long time. This is a major, major uh, move. And, and how do you think this will uh, move forward? We've seen some doubts about some NATO members and importantly, how is Russia going to react to the fact that NATO's borders with its own country are doubling in size? Well, I think, as you said, this is a huge shift of opinion in Finland and Sweden. I think in Finland, the uh, surveys before the Russian invasion were something like 25% or less of Finns uh, were interested in, in joining NATO. Now it's in the high 60s. Uh, perhaps, perhaps even more. So it, this was a huge thing for them. I mean, I, both countries were very proud of what they always referred to as their armed neutrality. Um, they, they both have really strong militaries and felt like they could, were better off uh, dealing by themselves with Russia. And, and this is a huge sea change for them. And it happened, as you said, very, very quickly. Um, NATO's really happy. Um, most of NATO, all but one. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I think that uh, in Washington, the administration is sort of describing it as a, as a, as a, the first sort of major defeat for Putin because one of his objectives was to lessen NATO's presence on Russia's border. And here, as you said, he's now doubled it in terms of the land border uh, with Finland. Um, they are both very enthusiastic about it, both governments. They were here this week. Uh, they've, been, they've been partnering with NATO for quite a long time. They participate in exercises. They attend a lot of NATO meetings. So it's not a big lift for them to sort of transition into being part of NATO. Of course, NATO is going to have to decide how they're going to participate. Um, uh, Russia's been a little bit um, not quite as bombastic as one would have expected, at least initially in reaction to this. They've said, well, it'll depend on whether NATO wants to station troops there or not. Um, you know, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, in terms of, of getting them quickly into NATO, everybody would like this to happen before the NATO summit in June. Uh, I think that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, narrow time frame, and, and that probably won't happen. Um, to become a, a member of NATO, uh, each member nation uh, of the 30 nations that are now there have to ratify their membership. Uh, their parliaments have to vote under whatever system they've set up. Turkey uh, has said it objects to this. Uh, Turkey has long had, particularly with Sweden, uh, an objection to, to Sweden's uh, allowing the PKK, the Kurdish nationalist group, uh, to have a presence in Sweden. And uh, Turkey says, as does the United States, says these people are terrorists and we cannot uh, admit a nation to NATO that allows this. Um, I think that um, in the probably medium term, they'll find a way around this. There's lots of things that Turkey wants. It wants uh, sanctions on its defense industry lifted by the United States. They were imposed because of its purchase of Russian weapons. Uh, they want to be able to buy uh, upgrades for their F-16s. 
Uh, they want to uh, have their defense industry be allowed to participate in producing um, U.S. weapons. And so there are lots of, there are lots of things, there are lots of ways around this. Uh, I think they haven't really gotten down to the nitty gritty of talking to it yet, but I suspect they will find a way around it. Uh, uh, Gideon, uh, I, I think Karen is right on, on the Turkey question. The question is always how, you know, how big the price uh, uh, to be paid. And, and by the way, interestingly enough, apparently the Croatians have now learned the, the Turkish lesson that if you say no, maybe you get something that otherwise mm -hmm. wouldn't happen. They want, uh, they want m movement on Bosnia, which uh, may be the right thing to do no matter what. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, one of the people who have pushed hardest for this is, of course, Boris Johnson, who not only has pushed for it, but he's also gone over and, and given unilateral uh, security guarantees, uh, at least in, in principle, uh, to both countries, at least in the interim, uh, which, uh, of course, would become formal when uh, they, the two countries become uh, parts of NATO. Uh, how does the How's that debate going in the UK? I mean, this is a pretty big step for a prime minister to take, to give a security guarantee to another country. Uh, should there be a, a debate about this in Parliament, or is everybody saying, no, we're on the same line, this is the right thing to do? Well, you know, it's barely been noticed in the UK. Everybody's obsessed with, um, you know, whether he's going to be fined for having a drink at his uh, garden party or, you know, what's going to happen in the next by-election, <laughs> like everywhere, by, by energy prices and uh, that kind of thing. But the magnitude of this potential commitment has not really registered that that much and i think that is partly because there is a kind of bilateral or a sort of um a consensus uh within the parties labor also is very strongly pro ukraine and i think that um johnson sees this as something that pays off both domestically and internationally that um at home it's you know being strongly supportive of ukraine and people are is fashionable and people i think are pleased that british arms have been you know exported and seem to have played an important role and i think uh you know talking to friends who've been to ukraine recently actually the british are very popular there they are seen as sort of even more forward leaning than the americans and so on um and so given that the uk hasn't been the most popular country in europe for a while since brexit um i think they see it as uh, you know, doing well by doing good, if you like, that the, 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 they're, they're standing up for freedom, uh, uh, but they are also making new friends in Europe, not just in Ukraine, but in Sweden, Finland, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're kind of rebuilding Britain's diplomatic position. Uh, so rather than doing it directly by, by trying to rebuild relations with the EU, they're trying to build relations with components of the EU that share their view of Ukraine. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, you know it's a smart strategy if you don't want to uh, deal with the big put the big uh, political power on the continent for for reasons that we all, that we have discussed many times before. Uh, Nahal, uh, do you see any debate on this in 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 the U.S.? Uh, you know, remember uh, in, in 1999 uh, we had a tremendous debate in the U.S. Congress, and it was very serious doubts whether, in fact, the first real uh, enlargement in the post-Cold War period that of Poland, Hungary, and, and, and the Czech Republic was going to go forward. Uh, of course, it did in the end, but we had huge debates with George Kennan uh, going public in the New York Times saying this would be a catastrophic disaster. Uh, we haven't had that kind of debate about NATO enlargement for a while. Is this one where we're going to uh, see uh, uh, some parts of uh, some parties saying, you know, are we really prepared to defend Finland? Uh, well, I don't really remember the 99 debate because I was in college and thought I was still going to medical school. So it was a different time for me um, than in Washington right now. Um, I know I, I don't I, I think mostly there's a lot of bipartisan support for the idea of Finland and Sweden joining. I, I, it's more it's more of an anti-Russia view necessarily than like, is this um, a smart move for the alliance and, and and that sort of thing. But you raised at the point about like, you know, are we going to see some folks raise concerns about this? And I, I think over time we will. We're already seeing um, a faction of the uh, Republican Party uh, raise questions about the ongoing military aid that we're giving to Ukraine. And this is kind of the Rand Paul isolationist sort of America first dish Mar Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene types and so it's a bit it's a bit unclear where that's going to go but I do think that you know over time you're going to see 
that crew, as well as probably some of the more restraint-minded folks in town, people who worry, um, you know, have worried in the past that NATO enlargement would cause more problems in a sport, <clears throat> and they could, you know, uh, raise some objections over time. I just right now, though, I'm not, I'm not hearing a lot, lot unless. You know, I, I, I'm missing something. Um, and Evo, I actually had a question for you since you are a former ambassador to NATO. How does one apply to join NATO? Like, there was some funny tweeting about this. Like, do you submit an actual application? Do you need reference letters? Is there a standardized test? Is there an essay? Like, can you tell us a little bit about what it actually means to apply to join NATO? So you, actually, you can't apply. You need to be invited. Uh, so the, the, the relevant article, Article 10 of the NATO Treaty, said that uh, other European states can be invited to join so long as their contributions enhance the overall security of the North Atlantic area. That's a paraphrase. Don't quote me on it. But it's something like that. So the question is, at what moment do you invite? Uh, and, and that is a discussion that takes place between the country that wants to join and NATO about whether they have met certain standards. And there's pretty rigorous uh, uh, set of standards that people uh, need to meet. Now, the, the Finns and the Swedes, because, uh, as Karen rightly said, there's a lot of interoperability. They've worked together. They've, they've been joint operations. And because they have strong democratic institutions, uh, meet all of those criteria uh, from, from, from day one. But so what they have done is they said, here's, you know, we'd like to join. And the decision that was blocked on Wednesday was uh, was going to be a decision by the North Atlantic Council to say, yes, we're going to move forward with an invitation. Uh, and the Turks blocked that uh, and said, no, not ready to do that yet. Uh, and of course, once there is an invitation, you then need a formal process, as, as Karen said, of ratifying because it requires a, a change in the treaty uh, because the treaty names all the members. Uh, that's that's kind of how it works formally. Uh, I think that it's, it's important to say uh, that, um, you know, we all remember Donald Trump saying, I, I think it was Macedonia, uh, was, was talking about... Montenegro. Montenegro. Montenegro, sorry. They, they were very uh, the group strong of small, people. Or, group yeah. of small countries that, that joined NATO in the, in the 2000s. Um, you know, why, why would we want to go defend them? Um, I, I don't think that's the case with, with Finland and Sweden. They, it, it, I think arguably they're... A, a, a net plus for NATO. Um, the Swedes have a very strong air force. The um, the uh, Finns have a very strong army. They have a massive military. They know how to fight in cold weather and in the snow, and and they're up there, very close to where uh, um, many, if not most, of of uh, Russia's nuclear weapons are, where its strategic submarines fleet is. And so arguably you say, wow, this is, this is good for NATO, um, as opposed to a lot of smaller countries that we might say, mm, it would be a problem um, with the Article 5 Mutual Defense Clause. And also a country like Ukraine, where, where many arg have argued and will argue in the future that it doesn't necessarily meet the kind of democratic standards um, that, 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 NATO, that a NATO invitation would require. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right, which is why it's more likely to be a smoother ride once, once you know, issues uh, that, that Turkey and some other members may raise um, uh, are resolved. So I think that's right. I, I'd also note that Finland and Sweden, of course, are Baltic uh, powers and, and having both of them join NATO really changes the dynamics, the, the military balance of power in the Baltic uh, Sea uh, to the benefit of NATO and importantly to the benefit of the three Baltic states. Um, let's switch gear, uh, and, and, and Gideon, um, you know, I think the big question everybody is asking is whether Joe Biden can walk and chew gum at the same time, which is for the last 12 weeks, for obvious reasons, in some ways, really since the end of 2021, the fundamental focus of U.S. policy, foreign policy has been on Europe, uh, maintaining a coalition, building the coalition, strengthening the coalition, uh, uh to deal with Russia. Uh, and to deal with Ukraine. Now, uh, this month seems to be Asia month. We had a summit uh, of the Southeast Asian uh, ASEAN countries uh, in Washington uh, last week, and the president uh, just arrived in Seoul for four days of meetings in Seoul, Japan, and uh, the Quad uh, may even have a phone call with uh, President Xi uh, while, while he's there. 
how is the United States going to balance, can it balance, can it actually advance both its Asia, Indo-Pacific agenda on the one hand, while maintaining uh, a European focus on the other? Well, th this is not uh, actually a new problem. I mean, I think ever since Obama announced the pivot to Asia, and that was that was when Kurt Campbell was working for the Obama administration, um, they struggled to to kind of make good on it because although there's an, a consensus that this is the area where the future of the world is going to be made and the 21st century is is going to be decided or the balance of power is going to be decided, the kind of urgent tends to intrude on that long-term perspective in the obama years it was the middle east it was this, the war in syria etc etc now it's europe and the war in ukraine um and you know it's always a bit of um a kind of there's no definitive answer you know i, I think that they, as in the, the obama years they'll do their best um and and i think they also understand the need to make these big symbolic gestures there were a few kind of cancelled summits i think in the obama years which sent a signal that you know actually you know it was mainly words and I, so i think simply by symbol the, the symbolism of biden going to the other side of the world to seoul for this summit and then on to tokyo sort of demonstrates that yes actually he is prepared to uh, even at this time of international and domestic crisis uh, focus on on the the long term challenges of asia i think that the difficulty is what kind of an offer can he make and i think that it's a sort of consensus in washington now but not one that can anyone can do much about that the the economic offer is lacking that uh, you know when trump withdrew america from the tpp now the CPTPP, that opened the door for China. Uh, you know, they've signed trade deals, RCEP and, and so on. America knows that ideally it would have a counter offer, but for domestic reasons, they can't uh, really offer one. They're, they're coming up, I think, with an Indo-Pacific economic framework, which Biden will be kind of touting about in Asia, but it, it doesn't have much market opening or indeed any market opening in it. It's more sort of agreements on tech standards, cooperation on supply chains, that kind of stuff, which is all all good, but it won't alter the fact that most of the countries that Biden is wooing have their most important economic relationship with China, even though they have the most important security relationship with the United States. Um, and, you know, whether that's a strong enough offer to counter Chinese influence, I, I, I'm not sure is, is the case, really. I, I think that's uh, that, that puts it really well, Gideon, uh, this, this sort of fundamental dilemma that on the one hand, security relations are driven out of Washington, but the economic power and magnet is, is Beijing. And unless Washington can offer something in return, uh, countries are going to be sitting on the fence. And I think you're going to see that in, in, in Seoul in particular, uh, even though there is a new president who is more committed to the bilateral relationship, the reality is economic relations between Seoul and Beijing are, are, are really the key. And, 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 and how I just, I mean, this, this, this obvious distinction between uh, an Asia focus that lacks an economic dimension has really been at the, at the core of the criticism of the administration. And yet very few people, other than saying you need to join TPP or CPTPP as it's now called, is, uh, uh, have have much idea how to do that because the politics in in, in Washington just won't allow it. Um, and is is there a worry that therefore maybe uh, we're we're actually not going to be as strong in the competition with China that everybody seems to think we should be doing right, left, and center in the American politics? Is there a worry that without the economic dimension, this just won't work? I think it depends on how you define the economic di dimension. I mean, if your belief is that we need to have a bunch of trade deals with other countries um, and that's what makes us strong. Uh, some people would argue, actually, we, we need to be more self-reliant and make sure we aren't reliant on this trade with other countries, including China among them. Um, so it just kind of depends on what counts to you as economic strength. Is it becoming more independent or is it continuing this kind of interdependence or is it finding that sort of happy medium somewhere? I think you know, this administration and I think this president in particular um, it doesn't like to admit this publicly, but it is highly sensitive to domestic politics and how that influences its foreign policy. Uh, trade is a very obvious reason, uh, example, I mean, but also you look at it in areas like immigration, for instance. Um, they they do, and, and, you know, the Iran nuclear deal, that's another one. They're very, very sensitive to how 
domestically, politically, something will play, uh, President Biden in particular. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't, you know, when it comes to this Indo-Pacific economic framework. In fact, I saw a headline in the Financial Times this morning um, in which it said that Biden is actually watering that, down that even further, uh, which is kind of amazing because, you know, an economic framework by nature is sort of already a watered down thing to begin with. Um, I mean, when compared to like a massive trade deal or something. So uh, it is, um, it's, you know, I just, I just don't see a lot of and, you know, in significant or creative movement on international trade from this administration so far. Uh, um, uh, Karen, uh, jump in here because there is, I mean, there's the domestic politics problem that the administration faced. There's also, it seems to be an internal division uh, within the administration, particularly between commerce and, and trade and to some extent the National Security Council uh, who have different views about how far we can push the economic agenda and how important it is to the overall uh, strategy of, of maintaining leadership in Asia right. uh, on the economic side. How, do, how uh, do you I think that's absolutely right. I think you've got the NSC saying, we, you know, we need to be tough against China. We need to um, keep tariffs in place, which the business community says, come on. And, and the uh, uh, Commerce Department says, you know, you're talking about supply chain problems. You're talking about um, the economy here. And it's just not going to work unless you have some, some movement on some of these other trade issues, uh, which inevitably involve involve China. So I think that um, that and the, and, and as Nahal said, the, the domestic situation, I mean, you know, let's face it, Biden has a one vote majority on a good day in the Senate and a, and a small majority um, in the House, and he's got an election coming up. And I think that, you know, they're so happy about what they see as the, I, I mean, I, this is not going to, sound like I mean it to sound, but the good news of Ukraine, you know, this is their foreign policy um, um, positive um, that they they don't want to get embroiled. In the, and they just before that, they had Afghanistan, which was the bad foreign policy news. And so I think that they're, uh, you know, they're hypersensitive to that. Um, and, and in a way, you, you, you can't really see too much of an out for them. Um, you know, the, the pivot, as, as Gideon said, the pivot to Asia, you can, even, you can go back to the George W. Bush administration. I mean, you know, everybody's going to pivot to Asia, but there are so many competing um, um, sides to that. And there are so many other distractions uh, to it that it just sort of doesn't happen, uh, short of some huge blow up that everybody says maybe will happen in the future, but hasn't happened yet. Yeah, Nahal, exactly. I think that's right. No. Uh, one other point I want to bring up, and I'm surprised like I haven't seen more about this, but the new South Korean president ran on an anti-woman, anti-feminist platform. And I, I just like... I'm just really intrigued by how Biden is going to deal with that. I mean, especially given the debates in the U.S. right now about abortion and things like that. But, you know, he's going to, to South Korea and this guy won by promising to, like, get rid of the Ministry of, you know, Women's uh, Gender Equity and, you know, saying that uh, women apparently, like, make too many false reports of um sexual assault and things like that. And, and this is in a country where gender inequality is a long-standing problem in South Korea. I mean, it's an issue, but the men feel like they're aggrieved and this guy ran on that and won and Biden's going to go hang out with him. And, and I just wonder how that's going to come up or if anyone's going to point it out and, and how they're going to deal with it. I'm sure that one of the enterprising reporters on the, on the trip will, will, will bring it up. And it's an interesting thing. I have told him to. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, it was, it was particularly young men who were aggrieved, uh, and I'll put that in quotation marks, uh, that, that led this, this uh, movement uh, that Yoon uh, responded to, which is kind of interesting. It's a little different than I think in, in other societies. Um, uh, uh, but a point well, well worth uh, uh, paying attention to. Gideon, before we switch over to, to the Americas, I want to, one issue back to you. I mean, there are some serious big secur security issues, and more importantly, North Korea, uh, where there is this fear that uh, uh, Jake Sullivan expressed and others in the intelligence community seems to be pointing to that there may be a, 
uh, a nuclear or, or a, a, a long range missile test while he is there. Um, and the reality is, you know, for all practical purposes, we haven't had a Korea policy. Is, I think that's probably strong, but it's probably pretty close to it uh, since the Hanoi summit where uh, Kim and, and Trump failed to reach uh, a, a deal. Uh, and there is this question of, you know, a major, major military problem in the region that that seems to be festering and no one wants to address. How do you think that's going to be uh, dealt with in, in the meetings here? Well, I mean, I think they'll, they'll sort of be crossing their fingers that these reports that North Korea is going to, you know, have a major nuclear test to remind them of the problem while they're there don't turn out to be true. But if it happens, I would guess they'll just default to the kind of normal finger wagging statements. We take this very seriously, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think they have the bandwidth for another confrontation with North Korea, which after all was, you know, Trump's uh, signature move in a way, fire and fury and all that followed by this bizarre bromance he had with Kim Jong-un. I mean, I, but it depends exactly what they do and how threatening it seems. If it just looks like a sort of, a, you know, stamping the foot to get attention, then I think, you know, that's one thing. If they judge that there really is a growing threat, then they're in a different ballpark. Um, and I think some of it will depend on on how seriously the Japanese and the South Koreans take it. Um, but, you know, just de defaulting actually to, to, to the earlier remarks about um, feminism and, and what the South Koreans represent and so on. I think it actually connects to our next topic, which is the, the, the summit of the Americas, because I think that one of the difficulties of being American president and being locked in this sort of battle for influence with China and to some extent with Russia even now is that um, you feel obliged on a moral level and both and, you know, for domestic political reasons to raise these issues that piss off the people you're trying to to uh, to to woo so that uh, you know you see it with Saudi Arabia where obviously they released the Khashoggi report and they're now trying to rebuild relations with the Saudis um, and it will be awkward uh, if he raises this with the South Koreans at a time that he's trying to sort of take advantage of a more pro-American South Korean president, you know, to balance off China. And it actually, it, it, I think it, it it also relates to Latin America. I was just looking at a piece in the, in the FT where they were saying, why has the US got so few friends in Latin America at the moment? And somebody said, well, because the Chinese don't care about this stuff. They never hassle us about human rights issues or, well, any position we're taking. Whereas the Americans, it's like, you know, they're constantly asking us in to confess our sins and then it's not clear whether they'll grant us absolution at the end of it. Um, so it is it is just one of the parts of being an American president. It, it's, you know, America has other powers of attraction, the soft power that we were talking about earlier, but it, but it's, it's, it does complicate their diplomacy, no doubt about it. Uh, that's a great uh, uh, switch over to uh, Nahal to to the Summit of Americas, which the U.S. is hosting for the first time since 1994. And, and you know, as I said at the outset, this this looks like a party uh, in which everybody gets invited and nobody shows up. Uh, uh, that was my lead. <laughs> uh, exactly. And so. Uh, what what's going on here? We used to be, you know, we proudly thought that we were, uh, 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 you know, the Americas and us are us, right? Uh, and somehow this seems to be slipping away, or it's just changing. The dynamic is changing, uh, and there's a real question of of America's penetration and leadership and and participation in the in the, in the hemisphere. Yes, absolutely. But before I get into all that, I just want to mention one thing that I'm seeing right now, which is. Russia is threatening to cut natural gas supplies to Finland on Saturday. Um, and so that is something to watch on that other subject that we were yeah. talking about, because that, that's a new development and that's something that's very interesting. Now, Summit of the Americas, absolutely. So this is the first time the U.S. will be hosting the summit since its inaugural version in 1994 in Miami. Uh, the summit happens once every three years. It, it's, this is once every four years because of COVID, and it's going to be happening in Los Angeles, or at least we think it is. Um, but as far as I know, uh, this June through six, uh, June sixth through tenth event, um, the U.S. has yet to send out invitations for it. Uh, as far as I know, they, those invites have not been sent out yet, and that shows you kind of. Just one example of what a state of disarray it's in. Um, a number of countries, including Mexico and Brazil, Brazil, whose populations make up basically half of Latin America, um, are threatening not to come. And the main reason they're citing is that the U.S. has said it does not want to invite Cuba, Venezuela, or Nicaragua. These are three adversarial anti-democratic regimes in the hemisphere, uh, and it looks like 
Biden doesn't want to invite them. And this has really bothered much of the rest of Latin America, not just those countries I mentioned, but even some who want to come. come. For years, the U.S. refusal to talk to Cuba um, was a huge thorn in the side of the entire relationship with everyone in the hemisphere. And and the decision by the Obama administration to invite Cuba to one of the summits and to have a relationship with them just really, really opened things up, made made the relationship with the rest of the hemisphere a lot better. Uh, but, you know, Trump reversed that. Trump, by the way, skipped the Summit of the Americas under his term. And, you know, now, uh, you know, the, it seems like that is going to be, once again, the, the main, or at least that's the main stated reason that a lot of these leaders are threatening to boycott this this event. Uh, but there are other things, too, I want to point out. There's a lot of frustration in Latin America with what seems like a total lackluster approach to the region from the Biden administration. Um, there's a real frustration with there being a lack of a trade agenda, even though we are hearing that the administration is working on some sort of economic framework once again for the region. But people feel like that's just very weak. They don't understand why it's taking this long. They um, And they feel like a lot of what the administration is doing is driven by domestic politics. And that it's not just trade, but also migration. Um, some of the people I talked to said, look, this is the summit of the Americas. It's not like the summit of the United States, you know, in which everyone shows up and deals with America's problems. We have our own issues, too. And we just don't think it's fair that, you know, this summit is being driven by the way that the U.S. Uh, wants it to be on, you know, agenda-wise. Um, now, a few days ago, um, the U.S. did do two things that maybe might ease some concerns. They lifted uh, some travel restrictions and limits on remittances to Cuba, and they are uh, saying that they will lift some sanctions uh, on Venezuela as well. These are fairly minor steps. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not that big in the grand scheme of things by any means, uh, but there is some hope that maybe that will ease some of the tensions. And Jill Biden, uh, the first lady, is also traveling to several countries in Latin America currently, and there's some hope that maybe she can um, ease some of the tensions as well. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it really remains to be seen. Um, and, you know, sometimes these summits can be, can seem very disorganized, but somehow at the last minute they get pulled off. Uh, but, you know, honestly, in this case, the administration doesn't have a lot of excuses. I mean, they've had a lot of time to prepare for this. And the way it's coming together now, it's, um, I can see why there would be some frustrations. Uh, Karen, you're you're a close observer of uh, for many many years of uh, of the hemisphere. Uh, I mean, there is there is the long-standing issue that the U.S. has a different policy towards key countries, most notably Cuba, of course. Uh, that Nahal mentioned. There's also this uh, this issue that 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 the Chinese just seem to be uh, meeting more of the immediate needs of the people in uh, in the region than the United States, whether it was COVID vaccines. Uh, uh, or uh, or trade and investment uh, without uh, hands being tied, at least not on the human rights and the other issues. Um, how, how do you see what's what's happening? Is the hemisphere really sort of changing in a fundamental way and, and being pulled towards <laughs> pivoting to Asia uh, in, in, in some ways and that that's what we're dealing with or is it still the older issues of uh, we have relations with Cuba, we have relations with Venezuela and others uh, I mean, it's not an either or, of course, but how do you see it? I think it all has to do with the, with with what's been the issue with Latin America for for decades. It's the sort of uh, little brother that you don't pay enough attention to, um, and you disrespect in in their view. You you expect us to come running and support you when it's something that you care about, and when it's something that we care about. You're not interested, uh, you know, and there is the sort of long history of of U.S. interference, actually, in 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 particular Latin American countries, in Central America, in Chile, um, and other places. So I think that that um, uh, although Obama didn't actually do much for Latin America, um, I think that the um, you know the 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 outreach to Cuba, the sort of um, getting rid of this, what they see as this kind of smugness and this imperiousness um, went a long way. Um, yes, they do. They trade a whole lot with China. China has massive investments uh, in Latin America uh, with far fewer strings attached than, than the United States has. Um, 
But I think their hearts are still with the United States. They consider themselves Americans. They are Americans. The, the hemisphere is America uh, to Latin American countries. And they, um, when, they, when it's something like, um, like uh, the United States saying, uh, oh, we're the hosts of the summit, we get to invite who comes, you know, their response is, no, you know, the summit moves to a different country every three years. It's not your summit this year. It's still our summit. And it's, uh, you know, we all decide who's going to come and everybody in the Americas can come. Even people, countries where there's no real love lost for Cuba or Venezuela or, or certainly Nicaragua, who's not in anybody's good books at the moment. Of course, there are lots of other countries, um, Guatemala, Honduras, um, that have in the eyes of many people, far bigger problems with human rights and, and anti-democratic practices than, than some of the other countries do. And there's no indication that they're not going to be invited. So it's, it's the United States, uh, I think, as Nahal said, uh, saying this, this is to discuss our concerns. Too many Cubans are trying to cross the border in Mexico. Um, you know, uh, Cuba's not democratic. Nicaragua's horrible. Um, Venezuela, um, you know, there's a lot of people see a lot of contradictions between the United States saying we absolutely will not talk to Venezuela. And then all of a sudden in March saying, uh oh, you know, we're in Ukraine, we need some oil, we better go talk to Venezuela. And they did. Um, to Cuba, we don't talk to Cuba. Oh, we have a big problem on our border. We better talk to Cuba. And they did. Um, so they see a lot of hypocrisy. Um, and it's one of the few ways in which they can really stand up. Uh, to the United States uh, and and sort of not suffer the consequences. Well, and, and I assume it also plays well at home. Uh, so there's a domestic political. Uh, yeah, and you have you have a lot of governments uh, farther to the left that are being elected uh, in in South American countries, um, and so I, I think that and and again, you know, the administration did a really bad job. Of, of organizing this and of saying months ago, well, we're thinking about it. We may not invite these countries. And then every time they were asking, well, we haven't decided yet and kind of gave everybody the opportunity to say, you can't do that. And so now they've got only three weeks, less than three weeks to go. And, you know, as, as was one Latin American diplomat said to me, you know, you can't even get a hotel reservation in LA anymore. Who do they think is going to come? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I just jump in on that? Like, I, I, like, put in for credentials to go. And then, like, it was, like, a week later. And I get an email telling me, hey, we got your credentials, uh, your credential application. But this is just an email to tell you that we got your credential application. We're not telling you yet whether we approved it or not. So I don't even know if I'm approved to go, much less if it's happening. And so I don't know whether even I can like book a hotel in LA where I know no one. So <laughs> it's it's Every a total country. Mess. So if you want to go to LA, go to LA. That's but you may <laughs> yeah. not get to the conference and, center. And then uh, the one the one other thing, the, and you know the Cuba and Venezuela moves that Biden has made in the last few days, the easing of restrictions, that's already angered Florida Democrats against him. So it is very sensitive politically, domestically for him in Florida at home too, even when he tries to do something nice for these countries that he's not going to invite. But that raises, Gideon, back to you. I, I, it does raise this really bigger issue, which is, is the United States, in fact, able uh, to compete effectively with a country like China that doesn't have the same domestic political constraints on its foreign policy behavior, even in their own hemisphere, which is pretty remarkable when you, when you, when you think about it. Uh, there is the economic dimension that we talked about. There's the political dimension that we talked about. But, uh, uh, you know, the reality is that none, by, I think other than Costa Rica, not a single country in the Americas voted uh, to oust Russia out of the uh, uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, if I'm right. I think they all abstained. Um, and, and so there is this question of, of whether uh, this is a, just a golden opportunity for the Chinese to exploit our own mistakes and, 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 and troubles uh, to their benefit. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think so. And I mean, I think obviously what we shouldn't forget that these countries have their own politics and there is a sort of left populist wave happening in Latin America now, which is, you know, ousting people who might be 
uh, you know, who would normally be sympathetic to the United States. So that we, we you know, there's about to be an election in Colombia, and Duque is leaving. Uh, you know, who's a pro-American, you know, educated at Georgetown, etc. Uh, although, actually, I remember when I interviewed him, he was very kind of pro-American. And then we said, well, you know, the Colombia, the Bogota Metro is being built by the Chinese. Uh, uh, you know, what do you have to say about that? And he said, well, they made the best offer. You know, what am I meant to what am I meant to do? So even they, uh, you know, are susceptible to to Chinese influence. But if you get um, left populists taking power in Colombia, Chile, Peru, Argentina, uh they you know they're they're not no. going to be from a, and, and mexico above all you know amlo uh he's he's not he's not the you know he's anti-nafta he's not like peña nieto or going even further back salinas he's a different kind of politician so these are people who are not well disposed to the united states anyway and they're not necessarily coming to power for that reason um it's sort of part of the package but uh, but they're they're just going to be difficult people for the U.S. to deal with. So there's a a broader dynamic going on, which you know is related to, you know, goodness knows what the widening inequality, the impact of COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then Brazil, but you know they actually have a right populist Bolsonaro who loved Trump, but who therefore hates Biden because he's not Trump. Um, so it's you know they they are really searching for friends in the region right now. Yeah, and yeah, no harm, Trump. I just want to I just want to update what I said earlier. I guess correct it because a source just texted me. The invitations to the summit of the Americas have been sent out. They were sent out apparently on Wednesday at some point. So at least that mm. happened. All right, <laughs> but the question is, who did they invite and who is going to show up? Did they invite uh, Nihal, but but no Latin American countries. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now maybe maybe uh, uh, when you uh, when the show ends, you can look in your uh, email and you got your credentials for uh, uh, for, uh, for for the summit. Uh, 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 Karen, last word last word to you. I'm. What's interesting is that while we are talking about this, this does not seem to be a big issue in Washington. Nobody seems to care in a way that if you remember in 1994 this was a really big deal when we did our uh, when we did the summit it sort of drove our agenda to the americas for uh, a long period of time it was used as a motivating force for that uh it looks like we're going through the motions and not doing it very well and frankly not a lot of people seem to care does that mean that the that our relationship with the rest of the hemisphere really is in in, uh, in a very different state than it's been well, I'll tell you who cares. The same people who always care about anything involving Cuba. Cuba. Bob Menendez, uh, New Jersey Democrat, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in charge of pushing the Biden administration's entire foreign policy agenda. Marco Rubio, the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relation Committee, Relations Committee, uh, Florida Republican, um, you know, has other powers in other areas. Uh, Jim McGovern, Massachusetts representative, Democrat, very, uh, you know, why can't we all get along, particularly with Cuba? So it, it's what always happens is that the people who care, care a whole bunch. And the people who don't care, don't care enough to stop them. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the, the tragedy here is that you know, however important our relationship with Cuba is, and it is important, it's been central to our history for a very, very, very long time. It seems to be driving uh, the policy towards the rest of the hemisphere, opening up the possibility of Russia, China, and indeed uh, internal political dynamics in the hemisphere to, uh, to determine where the future lies, not always in the interest uh, of the hem hemisphere or indeed of the United States. Uh, but that's what politics is all about in foreign policy. Uh, it's just another example uh, that we uh, face this week. I um, want to thank Gideon Rahman, uh, Nahal Tusi, and Karen DeYoung for an excellent di di discussion this week. We'll be back next week with another uh, edition of a World Review. And until then, bon weekend. Thanks, Eva. <laughs>